everybody calls me Curly. And I am the Pope of Elliot. I'm the only Pope in Elliot. I was born in 1938, Memorial Day, and I was born in Scarborough, Maine. My father was a clam digger down in Pine Point and dug clams, and he worked for Snow's Cannon Factory, which canned clam chowder, seafood chowder, minced clams, Welsh rabbit, and they're still going strong. And could you tell us when did you join the Coast Guard? Uh, the last week of August in 58. And when were you assigned to Whaleback Lighthouse and did you have any say in your assignment to Whaleback Lighthouse? I was assigned to Whaleback uh, in 60, early 60 in the fall and I had mutuals with the kids from North Berwick he went to the ship I was on, and I went from the ship to Whaleback. And I finished my tour of duty and got discharged from Whaleback down in Gloucester, Mass. Mm -hmm. So you did, you did have some say in it. You chose... Yeah, to I chose. I, they needed a light keeper, and they wanted somebody kind of familiar with the area, and I was it. Do you remember the names of any of the other guys who were out at Whaleback with you? Yes, I do. I remember William Beasley. He was a second-class engine man, and he was a ridge runner from South Carolina, and he could make the best bacon powder biscuits you ever ate. And I can remember Griffin. He was a second-class engine man and took care of all the engines, uh, uh, you know, the diesels to run the air compressors, uh, the cola generators to charge the batteries, and I was out there with uh, Alan uh, Peterson, a Norwegian. He was a Danish kid, so his last name ended in E-N. And he got transferred from Whaleback and went out to run White Island as chief engineer out there, second class. But we got along good and everything. And I went to Illinois, and it was the last time I ever went there. He worked my tail off out there. Weed and beans, being from Maine. That was my last trip. <laughs> uh, can you describe what the boat landing facilities were like uh, when you were a whale back? They were really good. Everything was still in shape. All the riprap was still there. Some of the granite was still fastened with them big U-hooks that go down and hold things where it's rough. And uh, we had a cement ramp pitched up just a little bit. You could pull it up on, at high tide, you could pull it up under the falls and get haul the boat out of the water because you couldn't leave it in the water or you didn't have a boat in the morning. And it, it worked out good. It was a good slip and it was on the northwest side of the light. So we were facing the Coast Guard base in there in Greenland, I mean in uh, Newcastle. And it was, you had to keep it clean because it got wicked slippery in the summertime from all the you know, grass and stuff that grows in the ocean. You put the Clorox to it and brush it down once in a while and you could get in and out of the boat without getting killed, you know. Can you describe the boat you had? Uh, when you we, had we had a just plain basic 16 foot Amesbury skiff painted white with the U.S. Coast Guard on it and a buff interior. And she rode good. When I went out there, we didn't have an engine, so I used to come in and go out with the tide. You know, I'd go in the Frisbees, row in the Frisbees with the incoming tide, and grub up. If I bought grub at Frisbees, or if, if I went to Portsmouth to the uh, First National over there in Portsmouth, I'd use the barber's car and he'd let me take his car and go over and get our grub and back out to the light. We had that one boat that we hung from them davits. You know, there was uh, six blocks on each rope, so it was six to one. In other words, it took me one pound of effort to lift six pounds of boat, so we had no trouble. 
There weren't no winters already then, it was Norwegian steam right there. Let's talk about the uh, the fog signal tower. Of course, the uh, you had the uh, uh, cast iron fog signal tower that stood right next to the lighthouse until, like you said, 1969, when they took it down. Uh, can you describe uh, what was inside that that uh, fog signal tower? You had your air compressors, which were uh, Worthington air compressors, five belts. You had two of them. We pumped a hundred. Uh, we pumped uh, 150 pounds of air up to the horn because they had taken the horn from the, where the can was on the back and put them up front, facing White Island, facing out to the shoals. And uh, this was just after they'd built Pease Air Force Base. And once they got Pease built, they put up a radar tower over the. Newcastle, and they used that as an approach. And when we couldn't see the red lights up on top of the radar tower, we automatically started the foghorn. How much work was it to get the, the foghorn going? You had, you, we had two, two 71 GMC diesels, and we'd run one diesel to work the air compressors, compressors to pump the air up to the horn, and then the next time it shot in, we'd use the other one. That way you could maintain your, your diesel engines and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked. What, was the, what were the conditions like when the, when the horn was going inside that tower? It was wicked hot. I've seen 140 degrees. You had one little porthole in the side of the tank face of Newcastle, about a 10 or 12 inch porthole, and you had to leave the back door open to the light so that the wind could and the air could come in and go up to the second story and where the engines were stored. It was hot. And there was one summer we ran for one solid month without shutting the light off. The horn. Without shutting the horn off, yeah. What about the noise? You got used to it. I'd have to listen to make sure everything was going. After a while, you really did. Do you think it affected your hearing? I got hearing aids. The first horn, the dull bell horn, which was on the tank, with a southerly wind or a southeast wind, that could be almost heard as plain as day in downtown Dover. And then, of course, we moved the horn, or they moved the horns, just before I was out there at the end of World War II, up to the front of the tower toward White Island. Um, let's talk about the uh, living quarters inside the lighthouse. Can you describe uh, the arrangement of the, uh, the rooms inside the... the well, when you went up from the, yeah, coming in the back door, you went up a deck, and then you went up the stairs, which were fastened onto the inside of the wall. You went up, there was a steel door there. You opened the door and you went in the galley. And when you went in the galley, we had a all apartment size galley stove. We had a TV that we had 12 or 14 inch TV we had hanging from the roof, from the overhang of the next room up because there wasn't room to have a thing to settle on. And you had four galley chairs, two were tucked in back on the table, so they were against the wall. So we ate in like shifts, you know, two guys at a whack, two guys at a town, eight. And then you went around a little bit and you had the window. And then we had a pot-bellied one wick oil burner that heated the whole light right to the top, except it never got there. <laughs> and uh, then there was a galley sink with a hand pump with a leather on it that when it froze in the winter, you had to lift the top of the cistern off and go down and chop a hole in the ice if you wanted coffee. <laughs> and then you come around, we had two big easy chairs that fit just in there, and uh, you were back out of, out side again.
going up along the deck up to the uh, office, which was facing Frisbee store. Where was your bedroom? I was the third floor up. I was above the office. Me and the fireman slept upstairs. And above us was a room where we stored all the gear for running the light. Like during the war, they had a cuckoo clock arrangement with weights, and you could run the light on weights. All that stuff was stored there, and then you had a hatch up through to where the lens was. And by then, you were 70 feet high. What kind of furniture was in your bedroom? I had, I, we each had one small desk to put your uh, dresser drawers to put your clothes in, and you had your bunk, and it was, as the light went up, the beds, the rooms got smaller. And it was tight. You didn't spend much time in your room. So uh, when you were there, uh, how, many, how many men were assigned to the lighthouse and how many were there at a time? There was a crew of four. And when we went out there, I went out when it was my turn to be on. I went out for 24 days on, six off, no running water, no shower, no toilet, all the short lobsters you could eat. I still like Spam, I still like deviled ham, and here I am, I'm still going. So there, but how many men were there typically? At, at, at the full crew was four guys. Right, but there weren't typically four there. No, there were three of us. There were three at a time. I three think. at a time. Yeah. With one on shore leave. With one wherever he was headed. Uh, so, uh, you, you just talked a little bit about what you ate out there. Uh, you, uh, were any of your supplies delivered or do you have to go ashore to get, get all your... We had to go ashore to... The only thing delivered was gasoline mm -hmm. by the 44 footer. We had to go, uh, we had to go ashore to get the gr gr grub. Mm -hmm. And Frisbee's had a meat cutter. Yeah. And we could get by, but when we really got our money and we pulled it all together, the Coast Guard gave us $66.10 a month per person. We'd pull that money and split it up between four of us. And I'd usually take the 16-foot skiff and go in and uh, tie up and borrow the barber's car and go over and grub up and a couple of beers now and then and back out to the light. I did. I had a girlfriend downtown Kittry. And the people that brought me up, I lived downtown Kennery, so we kind of knew each other, and I'd sneak in once in a while and get back before daylight, get the boat hanging back up, and look like I'd been in bed all night. <laughs> what did you like least about your time at Whaleback Lands? <sighs> really? Really, I, there was nothing I didn't like. You, you know, you had your maintenance. It had to be painted. You had to shine the lens every day. It took you two hours to shine the brass. And this was almost every day. If you didn't and it got dull on you, you, you spent a day. I'd go through a can and a half, two cans of brass oil, but it wasn't brass oil back then. It was some other thing named like that and it was good brass polish and you had to wash the lens every day we had special uh, liquid we washed the lens every day there was a lot of work to it and the light ran on liquid mercury the ball bearings were in mercury and in the winter time there was no heat up there and you, you know you wore scrapers out, scraping the frost off the windows once it got down to zero. And you had, the light was on a rear stand, so you could turn it up or slow it down to meet the, what the chart said the specs were for whaleback. You know, two ten-second flashes every two, every one minute. Or, I can't even remember, it's been so long since I looked at the chart. I know you've told me before uh, about how you uh, 
fished out there. Uh, yeah. Could you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I did. I caught a lot of hat, especially in the fall when all the, all the pollock were running. And uh, I could sit right on the, the windowsill. The walls at Wellback were seven or eight feet thick. I could lay right out there. But anyway, I could go out there and, and hang a mackerel jig over on a fish pole and bring a nice big pollock right up the side of the tower, right into the galley, drop them in the sink, take the sides off them, drag them through egg and flour, and be eaten in a half hour and throw the rack overboard. Either that or use it for lobster bait. <laughs> I think you shot a few ducks from there too. I did. We had a 22 out there and I could pick them off one at a time and put the boat over and go get them when I, uh, all the ones that were floating and we ate duck. And we, uh, we've eaten seagull eggs out there from, Horn, from uh, Wood Island right across Go over and pick them up and bring them back and fry them up. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of lobsters out there. No, no, none at all. In fact, the lobstermen took good care of me. We talk a little bit more about the light. You just said a little bit about uh, adjusting the light. Um, what was the typical process uh, for, uh, for, for working with the light? You had to time it. It had to be timed. There was a watch all night long. And the light had to be timed, and you, you know, two, a couple of times, especially when the weather was real. Summertime was great because it always stayed about the same. But when, when, once you got below 32 degrees, you had to, uh, you had to time it and keep an eye on your watch clock. We had a watch clock. We had a watch stopwatch right up there. So there, you know, was somebody, there was somebody on watch all night all the time? Oh yeah, somebody was always up 24 hours a day. You had to watch the two red lights over on Odeon's Point, you know, over where number two gunboat showboy is, mm -hmm. the radar tower there. And you, you had to watch the weather, you had to watch everything, you know. We, got a, we get a big storm, everything in the light ran on gas. Propane gas, 90-pound 90, bottles of propane. They were on the outside, on the catwalk, outside of the tower, on the tank, on the Garish Island side. And whenever we got a big northeaster, I mean a big one, you had to go out and see what you had left for gas bottles because most of them were gone take them, rip them right off. You know, we had, you had them tied down with rope and stuff in a rack, but they were gone. Now the light was electrified, but by the, that time. Yeah, we had a bank of batteries. We, we ran the light on batteries at night, and we charged the batteries all day long. They were 24 volt, wired in series. And that was on the second deck where all the fuel tanks were, above the uh, generators and above the diesels. On the wall right above the galley table, we had one of them wooden telephones in a wooden box with two bells on the front of it, all varnished up. And one crank, you got the lifeboat station. Two cranks, you got White Island. Did you use that much? Yeah, I shoot the breeze with Peterson all the time. Did you ever call White Island? Yeah, all the time. Peterson oh, he was out. When he was at White Island. He, yeah, once he got off whale back, he went to White Island. Yeah, we catch up on everything going on. So you mentioned that phone. Did you you had you have another phone for? Uh, no, uh, no. We had some of our flags. When the boy turned to come down, I'd give him flag signals A, B, C, D. You know, shut the hose off. It's running overboard. So wait a minute, you had this crank phone for calling... White Island or the lifeboat station. So you, you had no way of calling the mainland directly? The, white, the lifeboat station would hook you up with the main, the main telephone ah. at the lifeboat station. So you could... 
Yeah. You could call. Yeah, you you I could call the light bulb station okay. and he would either talk or plug me plug me in so that it was well back. So you could. You yeah, could call yeah, you could. And out to the light, the only person I got out there was the lighthouse, you know, the phone in the lighthouse at White Island. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the guys, because there was a crew of four there, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned uh, it's, you had a small TV there. Uh, was there much reception on the TV? <laughs> it was good when nothing was running. But when the fog signal would run, the picture would go to postage size, you know, because it put such a drain on the on the on the power. Yeah. And you was busy, you know. You had decks that had to be painted, you know. That brickwork going all the way up through didn't get painted by itself. Anything else you did for entertainment? And again, you didn't have a whole lot of time for for that. Uh, that's about it. I'd go over and get a good feed of flounder, hang a line, would take that Amesbury skiff and go over and hang a line on Fort Foster Dock. And I had a five point spear on a seven foot handle. I could fill a boat, I could fill the Amesbury skiff with flounder. So we ate plenty of flounder we, and we ate plenty of fish. And we put as much of that $66 in our pocket. So the $66 was above your, your pay? Yes, yeah, it was added on. They threw us a check, each one of us extra, above our... I think my pay back then was around $95 a month. We had a kerosene heater, or one wick in the galley right there, with a stack that went right to the top of the light with a Charlie Noble on it. And the decks, in the lighthouse going up through was steel. And the pipe going up to the stove, up to the Charlie Noble was galvanized. And they rusted off one deck, the galley, between the galley and uh, the second the office. The pipe rusted off. And on a calm night, flat ass calm, we used to get wicked sick. We didn't know what it was. You had to go out. You had to go out and sit on the rocks outside, no matter whether it was ten above or not. You couldn't stay in the light. And finally, one of the guys got hurt, and we had to call a forty footer to come out and get him. And they took him over to the Navy out to the Portsmouth Hospital. And the next day, Veratsis, a plumber up on. Uh, Isley to the street was out there replacing the pipe all the way up to the light, right to the very top, plus a new Charlie Noble. What is this, uh, Charlie Noble you're saying? Yeah. I don't know what that is. It's a vent that turns in the wind and sucks, a, it causes a big draft and it sucks the heat right up, state, right up the smokestack. Well, it sucks the heat, out, it sucks the smoke right out of the stove. And it had a grease fitting on it, and they galvanized. You can still buy them, Charlie Noble. It was like an attic vent, like this. Do you remember any big storms that happened while you were there? Yeah, that, that, we were, it was a good light. It was safe. But the noise was unbelievable because all the great big granite blocks that were at the base of the light had all broken loose from them big hooks that held them, and they banging all night long, wicked loud. And I, I could go right up on top of that light, 70 feet up, and in the big nor'easter, we had one or two of them every, you know, every couple of years. The waves, you, you could get soaked up there. The wave would go right over the top of the tower. But the reason it did that was because 2KR, 2 Seaboy, two Kits Rock, there was a 12-foot spot behind the boy, and when the waves come in from the shoals and came back together between that run between the boy and the islands out there, they climbed straight up in the air, and they go straight over Wellback.
So you were you were not quite there to the point of uh, automation. It, it, okay, I got out the last week of August, and they started automated. It opened the next winter. They went out and they took the tank off. They had a jack-up barge in 1969, and they took the tank off the back of the tower and took all that machinery out of there. And then they started with the batteries and all the automation stuff yeah. to run the light. So the automation was completed a few months after you were yeah. there? Yeah. And then the, the, yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, when, uh, so you left uh, Whale back in 62. Yeah. And uh, how, how, when, when did you leave the Coast Guard? I got out the last week in August of 60, 58, 62. Uh -huh. So uh, did, did you have any other assignment in the Coast Guard after Whale Band? No, I did my four years, and I went down and got discharged uh, from Mr. Crowley, Lieutenant Commander Crowley, down to uh, Lifeboat Station, Gloucester, and I was done. Sold them back 60 days worth of leave and said, see you later. And you went on to a, a long career as a tugboat captain. I time. worked for Portsmouth Navigation. Portsmouth Navigation. And I worked on the steam tug, the uh, Saucony Vacuum Number no. Five. She was a she was a mobile oil tug, and she was the queen of the fleet back in her day in New York Harbor. I worked on the Pegasus, the steam tug, and then I ran the tug Portsmouth which was the first all-welded naval vessel ever built in America, 1932. She had a solid brass wheelhouse, and they sold her when they were building them LNG tankers down in Massachusetts. They sold her to a guy that took the boat down there and moved the welding stuff around the side of the ship so they could weld and paint the ship. And then somebody got her and headed for New Jersey, and she sank off the New Jersey coast. The Portsmouth did. Nobody drowned or anything. But and that was. And then we got the Newcastle. I run the bath, the tug Newcastle. Uh, two or three of the others. And finally, I wound up on the EF Moran, running her. And I spent 25 years, and then I filled in five years call me up and come on over and let's do a job. And that was it. 89 I retired. Uh -huh. and, uh, July 1st, 1989. You've done uh, other work since then? Since yeah, I worked at Walmart for 12 years and had a good time. Mm -hmm. I've had a good time wherever I go. I know you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, uh, if you had the chance, would you be a lighthouse keeper again? If you could do it over again, would you uh, would you do that again? Yeah, I would. I would. It would it'd be nice to have a little more room than walking around in a circle for for four, three or four years. You know, like a what was it, sixteen feet, eighteen feet at the most on the inside. And you was always climbing up and down, up and down. Everything it was up and down, 70 feet. But you did it. I did it. Well, it seems like you're, you're proud of the, that period. Hey, I've done things nobody will ever do in the world again. That's how I feel. How many guys can say they was a lighthouse keeper? How many guys can run a tugboat for 25 years? Especially on this river. Very true. Well, the, both those things. I always, I, I always drove a Corvette all my life. I love to have fun, and I might be 80 now, but I ain't dead yet. That's my life right there.